on the floor. The man ignored those and rushed up the stairs, with Lemon following closely behind. They got to the top just in time for the screaming to start, and burst into the room to find so many bats there that they clogged the air. The human pup wailed in terror as bats clung to her nightgown and lifted her off the floor while her mother tried desperately to swat them away. The shutters burst open and the bats dragged the pup towards it. No, the man shouted, rushing into the cloud of bats without hesitation. Do the buck. Now that she'd caught on, Lemon understood exactly what to do. She barked and barked and barked, the speaking charm's magic pushed as hard as she could get it to go. Bats rained from the skies, but not quick enough for the man to fight his way through, or to stop the human pup from being pulled out of the window into open air number, the woman cried out as she lunged forward. But the pup didn't fall. Instead, the man who'd been at their front door earlier was suddenly just there, floating in the air, his cloak flared out around him, and the pup in his arms kill them he said to the bats swarming around him, with even more pouring in through the open window now. The man, the vampire, glanced down at Lemon, and added, all of them. Then the shadows folded around him again, and when they cleared, both he and the human puppy were gone. Lemon felt a low growl rising up in her chest. The vampire was bad, worse than the harpies, worse than the swamp hag. Even worse than pooping on the carpet, he was a bad, bad, bad man. She concentrated on the speaking charm, let it build up as much magic as possible, then released it. Bark, the sound wave crashed over the room, where all the bats were busy biting the humans, and stunned them all. They hit the floor like heavy, fat raindrops, thumping in one loud, singular wave. Both humans were breathing heavy, covered in bloody scratches and bites, but the man immediately closed the shutters then started stabbing every bat that so much as twitched. The woman joined him, but she used a rolling pin she'd snatched up at some point to squish them instead. Within a minute or two, there were no more bats, but there was a huge mess. Lemon looked around at the room and shook her head. She wasn't cleaning that up what do we do now, the woman asked go up to the castle and get her back the man said without hesitation how. We couldn't even stop him from taking her from our home, a place he couldn't set foot in. The man glanced over at Lemon, who wagged her tail back. You, dog. Ah, uh, Lemon. Miss Lemon. Right, Miss Lemon. Sorry. Look, I shouldn't have been so rude to you. I apologize for that. Her tail wagged even harder. It's okay. I forgive you. I've got to go now. Thank you for your help. That was the biggest wolf I've ever seen in my life, and I'm not sure I could have taken it in the house like I was planning. Ooooohoo. A wolf. That made sense. Those were like dogs, only bigger and meaner. And smellier. Not that that was a bad thing. Smelly things could be interesting too, but maybe not this time. It mostly just smelled bad oh no you don't. You're bleeding from everywhere. Go sit down and I'll get some bandages. I don't have go sit the woman said. Lemon felt her butt involuntarily hit the floor, yes, dear. The man plopped down on a three-legged stool that was way too small for him, and the woman started cleaning the many, many bites covering his arms, neck, and stomach where the bats had gotten up under his shirt. Lemon was glad she had a nice, luscious coat of fur. No bats had bitten her why is there a vampire here? Lemon asked don't know the man grunted. Showed up two days ago. Announced his presence, demanded fealty and, tribute. We all thought it was a joke at first. It wasn't a joke the woman said softly as she wrapped a bandage around the man's arm no, he showed us. The bats and the wolves are the least of it. He makes the dark darker and the cold colder, just by standing there. Bad magic lemon growled that's a good term for it. But he isn't invincible. I know all about his kind. Vampires like Hollington, I mean. They only come out at night. They don't like silver. A no can stake through the heart or decapitation kills them, permanently. Harmut used to be a monster hunter the woman said long time ago. Got a bit too old, 
bit too slow. Metizena, settled down. Which is why you shouldn't be going up there now. You gave up that life for a reason the woman said and I'll take it right back up again if it means saving Nimba. I'll help Lemon said dot the two humans turned to her, surprised. They'd both forgotten Lemon was even there for a moment when they started arguing. Lemon gave them a full blast of puppy dog eyes, no matter how old a dog got, they never outgrew puppy dog eyes, or as Hagarth called them, table scrap begging eyes, set her tail to maximum wag, and watched them all write the man, Harmut, said slowly. Can see where that'd be helpful, what with the magic and all. You are not going up there alone with only a dog to help you, magical or not the woman said flatly well, who else? Harmut said. Everybody is afraid to walk out of their doors at night, and I don't blame them. The dog is braver than any of them, but it's not their little girl up there in that castle, waiting for her dad to show up and save her. We should have left she said we're lucky we didn't. Why? Lemon said it's our home. We have nowhere else to go, no money to leave anyway. We all thought if we just stayed inside, he couldn't get to us. We just needed to hold out for a few weeks until help got here. Ha! Huh. Hollington showed up on the second night with the messenger we sent out and strung him up in the middle of town, then told us no one was allowed to leave. If the whole village had gone at once, bad, 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 bad vampire. Lemon wasn't going to let him get away with this we'll go together if no one else will help us the woman said Izena, no I love you, but you are not a warrior. I can't protect you and fight at the same time. So you'll take a dog, but not your wife. The man looked over at Lemon, shook his head, and said, would you mind waiting for me outside? Just for a minute. Okay Lemon said dot she trotted out the busted down door and sat down near the house. The neighbors were peering through their window slats at her, trying to figure out what was going on. One part of Lemon was disappointed in them for being cowardly and not helping, but she reminded herself that they weren't magical dogs like her. It wasn't fair to hold them to the same standards. She did her best to ignore the sounds of shouting inside the house, pretended she couldn't hear the words, even though she had no doubt the humans in the nearby houses understood every word quite clearly. A few minutes later, Harmut stomped out, now wearing a thick leather shirt that smelled a bit like oil with an unlit torch in one hand and a coil of rope around his shoulder. His sword was strapped to his back, and he smelled like blood, medicine, and clean linen are you ready? Lemon asked yes he said shortly. Hollington's got a ten minute lead on us, but he can fly and teleport. He's probably already at his castle. Come on, we have to hurry. There it is Harmut said. Pointing up into the dark dot it all just looked like smeared black to lemon. I don't see it. Well, it's there. You'll see it when we get closer. They were standing at the base of a cliff, one that was many dogs tall, maybe even more dogs than she'd seen in her entire life. Harmut seemed to think they were going to climb that, but lemon wasn't so sure you can fly, right, he asked I can levitate, but that is strictly straight up and down. She'd found that out the hard way when she was younger and had fallen into a ravine with a big scary river at the bottom. Up and down were the limits of the charm's power, and Lemon had floated miserably above the water, unable to escape without dunking herself and trying to swim to shore, something Hagarth had practically screamed at her not to do. He refused to tell her why, even to this day oh. I was kind of, you know, hoping I could get you to tie this to something so I could climb up. Stupid plan, now that I think of it. You don't even have hands. I can tie it. I have magic for that. Harmut's face lit back up, and he nodded. Good to hear. Looks like we're in business then. This here is 100 feet of rope. It's a bit thin, but it'll hold my weight. I want you to float up, find a good spot to secure it, and then I'll climb up after you. This is going to save us half an hour of climbing the trail, plus a two-mile hike up the valley to the base. And Hollington won't be expecting us to come in from the back. That all sounded good, so Lemon took the rope in her mouth and started floating up. 
she found a spot where a piece of stone jutted out at an upwards angle and looped the rope around it with wizard's hand, then tied a knot in it and called down for Harmut to climb up while she floated in the air, two dogs length away from the wall and unable to get any closer without Harmut's help. He reached the top of the rope and clung to the stone, then turned to give Lemon an incredulous stare. This is your idea of secure, he demanded in a hiss, giving the knot one swift tug. It unraveled, and he held up the rope to shake it at her angrily what? I never said I was an expert not here. I do a lot of amazing things, but even I have limits. Come here, dog. I'm going to show you how to properly tie a knot so I don't fall to my death. My name is La Miss Lemon. Right, well, Miss Lemon, come here so I can show you how to tie a knot. I... I can't. Hand me the rope please. I need you to pull me in. Lemon kicked her paws at the air in a swimming motion to demonstrate that it got her nowhere, then used Wizard's hand to snag the end of the rope from Harmut. After she got her teeth around it, he gave it a tug to reel her in, though a bit faster than she wanted, which resulted in her crashing into the wall. It was like being a puppy and not being able to stop in time all over again. Harmut showed her how he wanted her to make the knot, then had her do it. When she messed it up, he showed her again. After the third time, he gave up, knotted the end for her, and left the loop extra wide. Just pull here to tighten it down once you put it around something, okay? Okay. Lemon's tail wagged behind her as she floated up again the rope loop held between her teeth. She pretended not to hear his muttering, as it was beneath her dignity to take notice of such crude remarks. She managed to get the loop around a small tree growing out of a crevice in a rock, tightened it down, and then called for Harmut to come up. By the time he was halfway, she noticed the tree was starting to sag, its roots now exposed as they popped out of the crevice one by one. Lemon hurried to reinforce it as best she could with Wizard's hand by taking some of the weight off the rope, but she only managed to slow it down. That was enough, thankfully, though when Harmut reached the tree and examined it, he gave her the look, the one she got sometimes when Hagarth thought she was being a bad girl. Lemon didn't like that look. An involuntary whine formed in the back of her throat and her tail stopped wagging. Harmut just sighed and shook his head. He slipped the knot free and held the end of the rope out for her to snag so he could haul her in, this time much more carefully. Last section he said as he renotted the loop. Something sturdier this time, please. Got it. She found the perfect thing at the top. It was an old wooden post, one of a pair with scraps of rope hanging off it. Lemon looped the rope around it tugged as hard as she could to make sure it didn't wiggle, and tightened it up. Harmut did the last chunk of his climb, nodded his approval when he got to the top and saw what she'd used, and dragged her in from the air I forgot there used to be a bridge across the canyon here. Phew. That was fun, but also really hard. Levitating for that long makes me want a nap she said once all four paws were back on the ground no time for that now Harmut said. He pointed a hand into the darkness and said, Look, there. Hollington's castle. Now that they were at the top of the cliff, Lemon could see it. Calling it a castle was being generous, in her opinion. It might have been, a long time ago, but now it was a ruin. The walls had collapsed. Most of the buildings had collapsed. There were a lot of piles of rock, and not a lot of things to live in. The only thing left was a tower in the middle, and even that had holes all over it. Hagarth's tower was way better, and probably cleaner too. Definitely not spooky like this one come on, we need to find Nemba. Getting her back is more important than killing the vampire. You see her, you get her out of here. Don't even worry about me, okay? Ah, uh, no I think Izana would yell at me a lot if I did that. Why don't we just stay together while we find your puppy? My what? Oh. Ha. Huh. Okay, but listen. Nemba is top priority. Do you understand? Lemon's tail wagged uncertainly and she whined again. I think so. She didn't, not really good enough Harmut muttered. 
See if you can find Nimba's scent and track her for me. It might not be on the ground, but if you can find it, they set off towards the castle together, with Lemon running ahead and sniffing around. That cold, dead, hungry smell was a lot stronger now, and it was everywhere. She also smelled a frankly ridiculous amount of bat poop around the castle, which was especially thick under some of the roofs that were still upright scattered around the castle grounds. Bat poop didn't smell as good as a lot of other poops. In fact, it kind of stung her nose a bit. Lemon replaced her leash charm for her mask again, just to be safe. She was limited by how fast Harmut could follow her anyway, so that wasn't doing a lot of good on this rescue mission. She took her time sniffing around the buildings while Harmut lit his torch and looked for other signs. After a few minutes of work, they met back up. Anything, he asked I think I smell vampire over there, but I don't smell any humans besides you. Lemon led Harmut over to a collapsed archway and he peered into the wreckage. There's a tunnel under there he said, but no way for us to get in. Are you sure? That's where the vampire smell is strongest. He must have used magic to get through. We'll have to dig our way in. Hollington is going to know we're here, if he doesn't already. They worked together, Harmut using pure strength to haul the larger rocks off the top of the pile and Lemon using Wizard's hand to clear out a lot of the smaller ones that were scattered everywhere. They made lots of noise while they were doing it, but no one showed up to investigate not a good sign, honestly. Hollington probably has a bunch of traps prepared for us. I'll go first, you stay behind me. Can you carry the torch with your magic? Okay. Lemon picked it up and followed Harmut after he'd squeezed into the opening they'd made. It was easy enough for her to hop down, and the two of them descended into the dark tunnel, nothing but the torch to light their way oh, well, it's pungent down here Harmut said, his voice tense. Must be some sort of catacombs. Watch out for undead. What's an undead? Lemon asked, her tail wagging as she walked next to Harmut. She knew he was all serious and all, and that was fine, but she liked exploring possibly zombie thralls, or maybe reanimated skeletons. They're dangerous if you're not prepared for them. They can be strong, and they don't stop or slow down, even if you injure them. Hollington could have made them with his vampire magic. A skeleton is just bones, right? Yeah. Lemon's tail wagged harder. A whole person made of bones was the perfect prey for a dog. She would take it apart and chew on all of them, maybe even roll around in them. That would be so much fun. She hoped she got to see one before they found the bad vampire. The catacombs were made up of a lot of intersecting tunnels, all carved out of solid stone, and all largely looking the exact same in their flickering torchlight. They were relying on Lemon's nose to guide them deeper in, a task which she wasn't thrilled about since it meant she had to focus on smelling all the interesting smells, but wasn't allowed to go investigate any of them without Harmut getting mad at her what does a skeleton smell like, she asked, stopping to look back at him how should I know. Bones, I guess. Maybe dirt. Do they smell like cold? Harmut blinked at her. What does cold smell like? Oh, like when there's snow on the ground and it's really brisk, the cold is sharp and clean, and it takes over all the other smells. It's really hard to smell interesting things when it smells like cold, but cold itself is also fun to smell. Oh, okay. Ah, uh, no, I don't think skeletons smell like that. Are you sure? Lemon asked why. Harmut said, glancing around nervously. What do you smell? Well, it's not really cold. More like cold and wet. But, is that a skeleton? Harmut followed her snout as she pointed at something moving towards them in the darkness. With one hand, he reached up to grab his sword and draw it. That is definitely a skeleton he said. Lemon bounded forward, ducked under the skeleton's grasping hands, and latched onto a leg bone. With a jerk of her head, she ripped it free from the rest of the body and tossed it aside. Soon, she had the other leg bone, and the skeleton fell forward to crawl with just its hands I was right, skeletons are fun to play with. 
Then the skeleton grabbed her with one of its hands, and she discovered that hands hurt a lot more when they didn't have the fleshy parts on them and they were digging into her sides. She yipped in pain and tried to break free, but it wouldn't let her go not fun. Not fun. He yelped. Teeth flashed as Lemon curled up on herself and tore at the hands grabbing her. The skeleton's wrist bones shattered into pieces, but that didn't mean its sharp fingers stopped digging into her sides. Lemon tore at them, trying to pick them off with her teeth and her magic, but the skeleton was too strong. Then Harmut's blade flashed through the torchlight and severed the other arm at the wrist. Lemon stumbled free and hid behind the human monster hunter while she worked to remove the last of the skeleton's grasping digits from her you all right. Harmut asked after he finished chopping the skeleton to pieces bones are not supposed to fight back Lemon said. That is not how it works. I have half a min are you laughing at me? Harmut was trying, unsuccessfully, to hide a chuckle behind his hand. No, of course not he said you are. You're terrible. The important part is that you're okay, Miss Lemon. But from now on, you listen to me when I said to stay behind me, all right. Lemon sniffed at the skeleton, which was still twitching despite having been hacked to pieces. Okay she agreed good. Now, pick that torch back up and stay close. Hollington isn't just going to wait around for us to show up. Lemon scrambled after Harmut the torch hanging in the air next to them as he strode forward. His sword remained in his hand, and was put to good use several more times as more skeletons or zombies approached. The first time they walked past a corpse that had already been dismembered, Harmut stopped and said, Lemon, can you find Nemba? We're going around in circles down here. I'm trying, but, but what? I can't smell her at all. I haven't been able to the whole time we've been here. And the more of these zombie things you kill, the more everything just smells like dead bodies down here. You met Hollington though. Can you track him? I can try Lemon said. She wasn't at all certain she could pick his scent out of all the other cold dirt death smell lingering in the air. Then she noticed a faint, lingering thread of something else, something the other undead didn't have. It was that thing that warned a deer when a pack of wolves were stalking it, or a mouse that it was about to meet midnight, that scent that alerted them to danger. Hunger, just like she'd smelled when Hollington was standing in the street in front of her. It was hard to smell it over everything else, but it was there. Lemon put her nose down and sniffed round the catacombs, walking in tight circles as she tried to filter out the background scents. The deeper they went, the stronger the smell got. It led them to a flight of stairs, which Harmut took without hesitation. Lemon trotted along behind him, sniffing the whole way. By the time they'd reached the bottom, the stink was noticeably stronger. The stairs ended in a hallway that stretched left and right well past the light of their torch. Lemon paced back and forth, trying to figure out which way the smell was stronger while Harmut squeezed the hilt of his sword and cast worried glances out into the darkness well, he said this way, I think. You think? My daughter's life is hanging on your nose. Please tell me you're a bit more certain than you sound. It was completely understandable that Harmut was stressed out, so Lemon decided not to take offense at his tone. She gave him a reassuring wag of her tail and said, we'll find her. Then she walked down into the darkness, her nose leading her and Harmut towards Nemba and the vampire who'd stolen her away. There were no skeletons or zombies on this floor, at least not on the path they took. Lemon's nose led her unerringly deeper into the catacombs, until they reached a long hall with a room at the end. It wasn't the first one they'd found, but Lemon hesitated when they found the hall the smell is coming from down there. And something else she said do you smell Nemba? Maybe. It's hard to tell. It's got kind of the same smell that Hollington does, but not as strong. Harmut took off down the hall, startling Lemon and quickly leaving her behind. I guess we're doing this then she muttered as she took off after him. He was fast, but humans and dogs weren't really comparable. Lemon reached him before he was halfway there. The room had a chair so big it almost had to be called a throne 
and behind that was a coffin half buried in a mound of dirt. The lid had been set to the side, leaned up against the wall, and the interior was revealed. It was lined with some sort of red cloth, and it smelled absolutely horrible. Lying inside it, eyes closed and her chest still, was Nimba. She looked even smaller than usual in a coffin sized for an adult. The rest of the room was decorated to accent the throne. Tapestries were hung on the walls, rich carpets were laid out on the floors. Multilimbed stands flanked the throne on either side, each with a dozen or so candles burning in them. There were four pillars, one in each corner of the room, and several cushioned benches set up against the walls between them. What do you think? a voice asked from behind them. It's a tad simplistic, but honestly, there was only so much I could do when I returned to find my ancestral homes in shambles. It will be the work of years to restore it to its former glory. Harmut whirled in place and brought his sword up. Hollington he said. Give me back my daughter. Oh, I'm afraid not. She's quite important to my plans, I'm afraid. Harmut advanced a step towards the vampire. I won't let you turn her. Hollington burst out laughing and said, turn her. What use would I have for a four-year-old vampire? No, I'm afraid I have a different purpose in mind for her. Harmut charged the vampire, his silver-infused sword leading the way. Still laughing, Hollingway slapped the blade aside and shoved Harmut backwards. Oh, yes, silver. I see the vampire said, flexing a hand that now had burns across the palm. Painful, but not permanent damage. The ceiling, formerly a featureless black vault hidden in darkness, came alive with squeaks and chirps as hundreds of bats responded to Hollington's mental commands to flood the room. They descended on Lemon and Harmut, who was struggling to stay on his feet as they swarmed him. Lemon barked as fast as she could while Hollington watched, an amused expression on his face. He shook his head and laughed. You thought you were strong enough to defeat me. And the best you could do was bring a dog with a magic collar with you. The candles went out, all at once, plunging the room into darkness except for a small circle around the torch. Even its light was strangled by the bat swarm that rushed around the room, tearing at Harmut when they could despite Lemon's best efforts. She charged up her speaking charm, wasting precious seconds to get it to full power, and let out another bark. Sound waves rolled across the room, stunning or outright killing the bats. Hollington's expression went flat when he saw what Lemon had done. A mutt with a magic collar is still a mutt he said, disappearing into the darkness and jumping back out next to Lemon. She yelped in surprise and tried to scoot away, but he caught her collar in one hand and held her steady. An interesting toy, though. Quite interesting indeed. Who made it for you, I wonder? Let go. Lemon yelled, scrambling to get away from the vampire. He barely seemed to notice her thrashing and squirming, even when she bit his hand. Harmut attacked again, and this time the vampire showed his sword enough respect to twist out of the way. Then he brought his hand down on Harmut's, caught the monster's hunter's fingers in his own slender, pale white hands, and squeezed Ugg. Harmut cried out, jerking backwards. The sword tumbled out of his now crushed hand, and Hollington let him go. He reached down, unclasped Lemon's collar, and tore it away from her neck. For the first time in years, she no longer had any of her charms. She couldn't talk, or pick things up, or carry stuff. She couldn't bring her master's potion to him without that collar. She didn't even have access to the potion now. Lemon barked. But it was just a normal bark now, and Hollington let her scamper off now that he had her collar in his hands. Fascinating he muttered. Does it work on anyone who wears it? Nemba, wake up and come to me. The little girl's eyes snapped open and she crawled out of the coffin. No harm out whispered, cradling his crushed hand close to his chest. He scooped up his sword with his undamaged off hand and slid between Nemba and the vampire. Stop, sweetness. Don't listen to him. He's a bad man. Laughing again, Hollington took a step back and said, go through him. Nemba attacked her father, and not daring to hurt his little girl, 
he could do nothing but retreat from her blows. Lemon ran back and forth frantically, unsure of how she could help without her collar. She was still a magical dog, but now she was extremely limited without her tools. Are you just going to dance the night away, human? Hollington asked. Do you think you'll store me until dawn? Death by daylight is too good a fate for you, Harmut said darkly as he deflected an open hand slap from his daughter. There was far more strength in it than any human puppy should have. I'll cut off your head, stake you, and then leave your body to burn under the sun. Yes, yes, how tiresome. Can you even come up with any original threats before you die? Harmut spun suddenly and rushed away from his daughter to attack Hollington, and Lemon rushed forward to block her from pursuing her father. Her mind chugged along at full gear, trying to keep up with what was going on. Later on, everyone would scold her and tell her it was obvious what she should have done, she knew. That happened pretty often. But in the moment, Lemon was quite proud of herself for figuring it out. Vampires only came out at night. That meant sunlight hurt them. They were underground, and even if they weren't, the sun wasn't coming up soon. It had to be daylight, specifically, since the torch didn't seem to do anything. But did it have to be light from the sun? Lemon was, after all, a magical dog. The collar was nice. It helped her in so many ways every day, but it wasn't what made her magical. She'd done that all on her own. If the vampire thought she couldn't help without it, he had another thing coming. She rushed to the doorway while Hollington laughed. So much for the vaunted loyalty of a dog. It's running away. Maybe it's smarter than you, human. Too late for you to run now. Harmut turned his head to look at Lemon, hurt in his eyes, but also understanding. Lemon huffed and wagged her tail once. She couldn't do anything more to reassure him now. Then she reached deep for her magic, not the collar's charms, but the part of her that was pure lemon. It took a few seconds for anyone to notice, but as her magic coursed through her, it quickly became obvious what was happening. Hollington's laugh caught in his throat, and he glanced around wildly. He was the first to feel it, the one most sensitive to it. Lemon's fur had started to glow. Hollington streaked across the room so fast, it was more like he teleported than ran. As far as Lemon could see, he was in one place, and then he decided to be somewhere else, so he was. And that somewhere else was directly in front of Lemon, a raised fist coming down to smash her into a pulp. Except it didn't touch her. It got within an inch of her fur, and then Hollington bellowed in pain and jerked his hand back. Small fires danced across his knuckles and he clutched at his burning hand with a grimace on his face. Lemon's fur started to grow brighter, and Hollington leaped halfway across the room, this time not so fast that she couldn't keep track of him so this is your trick. You think it will stop me? At best, it's a delay of the inevitable. I will not be denied, the vampire ranted. Harmut blinked dumbly at Lemon, then looked over to Hollington. He started laughing. Why didn't you just do that from the start, Miss Lemon? Lemon let out a huff and pranced a bit, sending sparkles of golden light rippling across her fur and out into the air. The more she focused, the brighter she grew. But she held her place, blocking the room's only exit, and Hollington glared at her with hate in his eyes. Nember, kill that dog the vampire ordered oh no you don't. Harmut shouted. He leaped to intercept his daughter's wild rush towards Lemon and held her, kicking and thrashing, but not strong enough to break free. Hurry up, Lemon. She'll hurt herself like this. Lemon's magic poured out of her, brighter and brighter until only the corner Hollington was standing in was cast in shadow. Nember stiffened when the light fell over her, then collapsed into Harmut's arms. Her chest started rising and falling again, and he clutched his daughter close, with tears running down his face. He looked over her head at the Hollington, who was shielding his face behind his cloak. What's wrong, vampire? This, isn't, over he ground out through gritted teeth. The shadows cloaking him faded more with each second, and little tufts of fire ignited around him. 
the cloak went up in a flash, leaving Hollington's pale skin exposed and blistering. Darkness rolled across the room with explosive force, pushing out of the corners and lashing at Lemon's brightly glowing fur. She was shoved backwards, forced to give ground as each wave of shadows crashed against her, but Lemon bared her teeth and moved forward again. As much as she wanted to race across the room and tear into the vampire, she was afraid if she left her position in front of the door, he'd find an opportunity to flee. She needed Harmut to do something, but with his one hand useless and the other holding his daughter, he seemed to be out of the fight. If he didn't break the stalemate soon, Lemon would run out of magic. And without her collar, she couldn't tell him. Another wave of shadows broke against her light, and Lemon's legs shook. She looked over at Harmut and barked. Blinking, he looked back at her. She barked again. What, he asked. Dot mentally, she prodded him, but he didn't seem to be getting it. Another bark what, he demanded again. Dot the light started to fade, and Hollington's posture straightened. Darkness surged up around him again, stronger now. Lemon growled and tightened up her focus, but she knew it was a losing proposition. If Harmut didn't get the message soon, she'd have no choice but to charge at Hollington and hope to pin him down. Oh. Harmut said. He laid Nenka down, scooped up his sword, and advanced on the vampire. Finally step into my reach and I'll eviscerate you Hollington said if you could, you wouldn't bother warning me. The blade flashed through the air, and Hollington flinched back. Fire burst off his shoulders when he lost his focus on the darkness, and he cried out as renewed light scorched him. Harmut dodged between the open flames exploding out of the vampire's body and slashed through an outreached hand. The limb went tumbling through the air to roll across the floor. Hollington stared at it incredulously for a moment, then looked down at his new stump. You, insolent little, Fang suddenly bed, Hollington lunged forward and grabbed Harmut by the neck. Using a thumb and terrible vampire strength, he tilted the monster hunter's head aside. Your dog is weakening already, and your blood shall restore me to full strength. Just as the vampire's teeth pricked Harmut's neck, Lemon let out a final burst of golden light, strong enough to burn away the shadows and scorch vampire flesh. Hollington cried out, and Harmut's arm came up to slash his silver-edged blade across the undead's neck. An expression of pained surprise was frozen on Hollington's face as his head rolled clear of his body. A moment later, it disintegrated into dust. Lemon's magic ran out then, and the room plunged back into darkness beaten back only by the flickering light of their torch, cast away into the corner. Harmut staggered back over to his daughter and scooped her up, while Lemon retrieved her collar from a brand new pile of ash where the vampire had been standing. She gave it a vigorous shake to knock the heaviest clumps of ash off, then trotted over to Harmut, the collar still in her mouth. With her nose, she pressed up against him to get his attention. Ha! Huh. Oh, let me just, it was awkward with his maimed hand, but he did eventually get the collar back on. Its magic reconnected to Lemon, and she let out a happy hoof. That's much better she said, tail wagging how come you didn't do that golden light thing earlier? Harmut asked as he stood up, his daughter cradled in his arms. She hadn't woken yet. But Lemon could smell all the bad and cold and hunger was gone now I didn't know it would hurt vampires until you started talking about daylight. Seriously. Everybody knows that. That's the first thing a vampire hunter learns. Well, I'm not a vampire hunter. I'm a magic dog. Harmut laughed and shook his head. Fair enough. Come on then, Miss Lemon. I know a certain mother back home who is worried sick about this little girl, and a whole town that will be relieved to hear the vampire threat is over. Together, they walked through the catacombs, now empty of the undead that had been animated by the vampire's bad magic. Lemon would not say the place smelled good, but it was interesting instead of bad. Asterisk 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 after they brought Nemba back, the whole town turned out onto the streets to celebrate. A healer looked at Harmut's hand and announced that he could restore it to full functionality after he checked on Nimba. 
She was just tired from the whole traumatic ordeal, and he ordered a night of bed rest for the little girl. Lemon needed another bath after the night's excitement, and quickly found many humans willing to provide her with treats, pets, and whatever else she might ask for. They got her cleaned up, fed, and bribed her to show off her special vampire slaying light for the whole town. Every time she did it, a new round of cheering went up. The sun was just starting to cast the first morning shadows when the celebrations finally died down. Lemon went to sleep at the end of Nemba's bed, with Harmut and Izana's blessing. She woke up a few hours later about the same time as Nemba did. Specifically, she woke up when the little girl wrapped her arms around Lemon and said, Doggy. Lemon's tail thumped against the bed and she licked Nemba's face sending the girl into a fit of giggles that summoned her parents to her bedroom door. Good morning, sweetness Harmut said Daddy. Nemba disentangled herself from Lemon, hopped off the bed, and ran over to wrap her arms around his leg oof. Easy there. Your old man's a bit roughed up from beating up that mean old vampire. He wobbled in place and looked over at Lemon and smiled. Good thing he had some help, huh? Good thing Izana said. Though from what I heard, it was more like Lemon took care of the vampire and you helped her. It was a team effort. Harmut protested come on, team let's get some breakfast. For Lemon, breakfast was a plate of pork chops, which might just be her new favorite thing to eat. While she was scarfing down her food, Izana said, what will you do now, Lemon? I have to get to Capsulin. I have to deliver something to my master there. Capsulin, ha. Huh? That's about a two-day walk from here Harmut said. Of course, a magical dog like you could probably make it faster. I hope it doesn't take that long. I need to get there as soon as possible. Guess you'll be on your way after breakfast then. Lemon gulped down another mouthful of meat. Fortunately, she could talk while chewing, so that didn't stop her from answering, I should, yes. Don't go, Miss Lemon. Stay here Nemba said she has to, sweetness. But I'm sure she'll come back to visit sometime. Yep. You know Harmut said, you could save a lot of time by going across some canyons instead of having to go around them or climb them. Why don't you take that rope with you? That did sound helpful, but Lemon planned on taking the portal back home with her master. Are you sure? I don't know when I'll be able to return it to you. Don't even worry about that Izana said firmly. You helped save our little girl. A spare length of rope is the least we can repay you with. Hey now, that's my best rope. Harmut said. He shook his head and told Lemon, don't underestimate how useful a good length of solid rope can be. If you plan on going on any new adventurers, you just might find you need it. Thank you Lemon said and when you're done eating, we're going to work on your knot tying some more. That's very important for successfully using a rope. Thank you. Her voice was a lot more subdued that time now, I know you don't have much time, so we're going to focus on just a few specific knots that you should be able to do without thumbs. Come on, I'll go over them with you, and once you've got the hang of them, I can give you some directions for getting out of the valley. From there, you just need to follow the road. How long do you think that'll take? Lemon asked our or so to show you what to do, save you six hours of climbing switchbacks in the trails. Then a day or so on the roads. You should get there tomorrow afternoon at a human's walking pace. Lemon wasn't sure that would be soon enough, but if that was as fast as she could make it, then Hagarth would just have to wait until then. She'd done a lot of good work on this trip already, stopped bad magic three different times now. Or was it four? Lemon wasn't good at counting okay, show me what to do. An hour later, Lemon had a coil of rope stored in her bag and stood next to Harmut at the edge of town. You sure you've got it all, he asked I'm sure. And if I get lost, I'll figure it out. Good luck, Miss Lemon. Thank you again for everything. You're welcome. I'll come visit again soon. Please do. Nemba is going to ask about you every day. It's not often you get to meet a magical dog.
Lemon bade her farewells and, tail wagging, got back on the road. As it turned out, there was a good reason roads existed. People used them because they were faster, even when they had to take the long way around stuff. Lemon didn't regret her detours, but she was now sure she would have made better time if she'd stayed on the roads. Of course, if she'd come through Tambles Crossing at a different time, that vampire might have succeeded in abducting Nimba, so Lemon liked to think it had all worked out well in the end. But now it was seriously time to get to the conference, and after she made her way through the mountains and got back to the flatlands, she made up for lost time by setting a grilling pace that was sustainable only through copious amounts of sausage consumption. By the time the sun was hanging at its peak in the sky, Lemon was looking down at a great, sprawling collection of buildings with hundreds of farms scattered around it. All of that was overshadowed by a floating island, far up in the air and connected to the ground only by a single shimmering pillar of light that shone brightly through the shadows as it reached up into the center of the island's underbelly well, that's probably it Lemon said to herself. Wizards did like their stuff to be extra fancy. Why have a conference on the ground when they could float a huge chunk of land into the air and anchor it to the city with a literal strand of light? Either way, the important part to her was figuring out how to get up there. Lemon followed the road down to the city, past the farms and other travelers. She ducked around wagons and carts, dodged soldiers on horseback who clanked with each jarring step their mounts took, and resolutely ignored enterprising farmers who'd set up stands on the roadside though there were a few difficulties resisting the ones who were selling meat here, Pooch one of the farmers said when she walked by. Where's a fine-looking dog like yourself off to today? I'm delivering something to the wizard's conference up on the floating island Lemon told him, causing the man to stumble back in shock Whoa. That's not something you see every day he said, scratching his head. Then again, it's wizard season. I've seen weirder. What? I'm not weird. That's so rude. Oh, um, my apologies, miss. I didn't mean to, you know, insult you. You gotta admit though, it's not every day you meet a talking dog. That doesn't make me weird Lemon insisted no, no, you're right. That was my mistake. Let me make it up to you the farmer said. He cast his gaze around his stand for a second, then added, ah. Uh, I don't suppose you're a fan of carrots or turnips? Not really, no. Don't blame you. Not proper food for a pooch such as yourself. I appreciate the thought, but I am on a deadline Lemon said. Though if you've got any advice for reaching that island, I'd gladly take it. Oh, uh, I don't know much about that. The light lands in the rich district, and there's a bunch of guards hired to keep people who aren't supposed to be there away from it. I'm sure they'd let a magical talking dog through, right? Obviously, you're supposed to be at a wizard's meetup. Yeah. Exactly. Plus I'm making a delivery for a wizard who's attending, so they should let me up, no problem. Sure hope so the farmer said. If a magic dog can't get through, nothing can. I'm real sorry again about what I said, miss. It's fine. I've been called worse. Tell you what. I've got a friend of mine who's selling mutton a quarter of a mile down the road. You get there, tell him Triblo sent you. Get yourself a piece on me. The farmer flicked a fat copper coin through the air, which Lemon caught with Wizard's hand. She stowed it away into her messenger bag charm and said, thanks. I will. You have a good day now, Miss Talking Dog. Best of luck to you. Lemon kept on trotting down the road, her nose leading the way and drool practically falling off her tongue at the thought of a nice, hot chunk of mutton. She sniffed repeatedly at various stunts until she found one that smelled right. Approaching it, she asked, Do you sell mutton? The farmer had a small portable stove set up and a rack of meat near it. He blinked owlishly at her, surprise evident on his face. I, do, yes. Triblo said to tell you to sell me a piece on him, and gave me this. She produced the copper coin out of her bag and held it out to the bemused farmer, who picked it out of the air where it floated in front of him. Well, 
Guess I owe you a piece of mutton. How do you like your meat? As soon as possible. I'm in a bit of a hurry lemon said dot the farmer laughed and said, raw as I can make it and still call it cooked. Got it. He started cooking while lemon watched. She wasn't staring, that would be rude. Sure, she was, intent on the process, but it was only natural to be curious. She definitely did not lick her chops at any point in the process so, dog like you out here, I'm guessing you're part of the big wizard thing the farmer said, waving a hand in the direction of the island sort of. I'm on my way there now. Figured you had to be. This'll just be another minute he said, prodding the mutton. A bit lighter than I'd normally do it, but if that's how you want it. Listen, when you get into the city itself, you're going to want to be careful. They don't just let pets run around unattended, and it would be easy to mistake you for a lost dog if I didn't know any better. You might have some troubles with the city guard if you just go strolling down Main Street. I'll just explain to them that I'm not a lost pet. Sure, and that'll probably work, but how much time will it cost you if you have to keep telling every guard you meet? You said you were in a hurry. That's true Lemon said, her eyes flicking up from the cooking meat to the farmer and back down again. What do you think I should do? Well, if you were a person, I'd say to stay on the main street and avoid the shadier parts of the city. But I don't see any reason anyone would bother a dog walking down those streets. If you don't mind going out of your way, you could probably take Wall Road all the way around then cut through Fisher's Square to get to Gold Hill. That's where the island is anchored with that column of light. You'd still have to explain who you are to the guards there, but it beats dodging every dog catcher in the city, right? I guess so. Lemon had no idea, in all honesty. She hadn't planned any further ahead than walking directly towards the pillar inside the city and figuring it out once she got there. The very idea that there were humans who had a dedicated profession that revolved around catching dogs seemed absurd to her, but there was no reason to think the farmer was lying about it. It wasn't like Lemon couldn't defend herself if she needed to, but if getting to her destination without a hassle meant an extra half an hour of walking, that wasn't too steep a price to pay. Wall Road, Fisher's Square, Gold Hill. Got it. There's some rough neighborhoods on Wall Road but I can't see anyone trying to hit up a dog for a road toll as long as they think you're just a normal dog. You just go on through as quick as you can, straight in one side and out the other, and everything will be fine. Okay Lemon agreed. The farmer just shook his head, poked at the chunk of mutton again, and nodded to himself. Ah, normally I'd put this on a skewer, but you don't have, you know, hands. I don't have a plate for you either. That's not a problem. I'll just take that and, the mutton rose off the portable stove, causing the farmer to jerk back out of the way, and floated over to Lemon. She licked her chops, for the first time, and took a nibble off the corner. Still hot. Well yeah. Silly dog. Just give it a minute for the steam to stop coming off it. Patience was not one of Lemon's virtues, and despite her best efforts, she ended up eating it with large, open-mouthed chews to mitigate the burning of her mouth. The farmer just shook his head and laughed. Even a magical dog is still a dog, after all. After pulling her bowl out of her bag for a drink, again surprising the farmer, Lemon got back on her way. Capsulin was only a mile or two down the road, and from there the distance to the conference would be measured in minutes. Despite all the setbacks, Lemon was going to make it in time after all Wall Road was a bit confusing to find, since the city didn't actually have a wall around it. It turned out that it instead referred to a five dogs high wall that split part of the city's interior, with one side being made up of market districts all crammed together and pressed up against the wall. The other side was all residential, and the wall had been put up to keep the market from spilling over into people's homes. It had a thin road winding along next to it, more of a dirt alley between the houses and the wall than anything. At least, that's what the old codger she'd asked for directions had told her, not that she'd asked. Lemon trotted along, taking in the smells and the sights. People walked the road next to her, 
going between houses and using the gates that studded the wall to enter the market district. Each gate was labeled, but Lemon didn't bother to try to read them at first. She wasn't good with letters anyway. It was only after she'd gone by a handful that she had the thought to look closer and see if any of them led to Fisher's Square. It didn't much matter to her if she missed it, as long as she kept heading towards the pillar of light, but she figured she ought to at least try to follow the directions she'd been given. She spotted a kid running in her direction, older than Nemba or the trio from Wilbergy. He had short blonde hair and dirty, patched clothes and he smelled like sweat, leather, and fear excuse me, can you tell me where to hey? Where are you going? The kid ran right past Lemon without even slowing down, so she took off after him. He glanced back at the dog, did a double take, and gasped out, did you, just ask, me a, question? I did, yes. Why are you in such a hurry? Couple guys from the neighborhood are after me. They say my family owes them money, but they're liars. Sure enough, for older boys, maybe adults, Lemon wasn't great at telling when human puppies became human adults, were rushing down Wall Road after the boy. Two of them brandished clubs, and one had some sort of cooking knife. Oh, yeah. You should probably run faster. That's, what? I'm doing. The boy huffed and puffed as he ran for all he was worth and Lemon followed along behind him. In here he said, ducking to the side and crawling into a big old wooden crate that had half the side rotted out. Lemon followed behind him, her tail wagging furiously, and saw that the house it was pushed up next to also had a hole in it. They went completely through into some sort of crawl space underneath someone's home few, I think we're safe the boy said dot suddenly. The crate was ripped away from the wall and sunlight filtered into the crawl space. Come on out, you little freak a harsh voice demanded. If we have to come in after you, it'll only make things worse. The boy cast about fearfully, looking for another way out. There was only the single entrance to the crawl space, at least as far as she could see, but the boy crawled over to a spot and started pushing up on the floor overhead. He strained but no hidden hatch opened its locked or something the boy hissed. We're trapped now. How'd they even know about this place? What do you want to do? Lemon asked not going out there, that's for sure. They want me, they can come in and get me. I'm not asking again the voice said why are they chasing you? Something told Lemon it wasn't a game. The boy's pursuers were mad about something no reason the boy said, too quickly. Lemon's head swung around to stare at him, and he squirmed. I, might have taken something from them. Stealing is bad. They stole it from my family first. The boy reached into his pocket and pulled out a pair of thin silver coins. Called it protection money. Only thing we need protecting from is them. The face of one of the men chasing the boy appeared in the opening, neatly silhouetted against the daylight. He held up the glinting knife and said, you're gonna regret messing with us. Gonna cut you up, and your PA's gonna pay double next week. The man flinched back at Lemon's sudden growl. And if that dog of yours bears its teeth, I'll kill it. The growl only got louder, and Lemon paced forward, already charging her speaking charm. The man scooted backwards and climbed to his feet. Whoa there, mutt. Lemon unleashed the bark on the group. All of them cried out and flinched back. Before they could recover, she let another bark wash over them. By the time the third one hit, they were in full retreat that's right. Run away and don't bother me anymore. The boy crawled out from behind her and, rubbing at his ears, said, that was loud. What did you do? Just a bit of magic. Oh. You can do magic too. Yes. I'm a magical dog Lemon said could, could you teach me how to do that? I don't know how to do much, but I do have a few tricks. Want to see? Sure Lemon said, tail wagging. Thoughts of the ruffians who'd chased the boy were already fading from her mind okay, well, first, I can do this. The boy held up one of the coins, showing it to Lemon. Then he held up his other hand, currently empty. 
the coin disappeared from between his fingers and reappeared in the other hand. I can only move stuff a few feet, but I'm getting better. Oh well. That's amazing. What else can you do? This too. The boy's face scrunched up and he took about 10 seconds to get his magic ready, then he put both hands on the wall and started to climb. His feet dangled off the ground as he went higher, climbing straight up as fast as if he were scaling a ladder. After a few seconds, the magic gave out and he dropped back to the ground. That's how I got into their hideout and got my dad's money back. I wish I could do that. Though, I guess. I have other stuff. Hagarth had warned her not to tell people that the collar was magical. He didn't want anyone stealing it from her. It was best for everyone if she just didn't call any attention to it what kind of stuff can you do? Well, I'm way smarter than a regular dog. Yeah. And you can talk. And bark really, like not loud, but intense, you know. Yeah. I'm Lemon. What's your name? Bon. Hey, do you want to come meet my family? It's not every day a magical talking dog shows up. Oh Lemon said. Her tail stopped wagging. I kind of have to go to the wizard conference first. I have an errand to run. Maybe after. Up on the floating island. Bon asked, looking up at the giant chunk of rock. This close to it, it was hard to see anything except the raw, earthy underside. Some sort of magic kept bits and pieces of it from crumbling off to rain down on the city, but that did nothing to enhance the view. For the citizens of Capsulin, the conference was probably a massive inconvenience and an eyesore yep. My master is a wizard. He's up there now. I have to go run some stuff up to him. Up on the island Bon muttered, still staring at it. Can I come too? I thought you had to go home. It'll be alright if I'm a little bit late. Lemon didn't see any reason why Bon couldn't go with her if he wanted. In fact, it might work out better for her. Do you know where Fisher's Square is? I'm supposed to be going there, then to Gold Hill. Oh, to where the light touches the ground. I know how to get there. Follow me. Bon led Lemon across the city, pointing out various places as they went. That's Gannis Park there he said, pointing at a small square of grass with a handful of trees growing out of it. And there's Janelle's. She makes food for the rich people, and sometimes if there's extra, she gives it away to us. Lemon dutifully observed each place Bon pointed out, and occasionally asked a question. What kind of food does Janelle make? Does she make sausages? Oh, I don't know. I've never seen one in the leftovers, but she makes lots of different stuff. So maybe. A sausage sounded really good, but as Lemon found out when she went to pull one from her storage, she'd eaten the last one. She let out a low, sorrow-filled whine. At least the journey was almost over. Though. Hagarth might not be thrilled that she'd eaten all of their sausages. She'd just have to remind him how much effort she'd gone through to bring him his potion you okay? Bon asked yeah, I was just thinking a sausage sounded good. It does the boy agreed. But, ah, uh, I need to give this money back to my dad. I can't buy anything with it. Sorry. It's okay. I'll get my master to get me more later. Things went well until they reached the end of the street. It poured out into another, wider one paved with bricks that ran around the slope of a large hill, with a fence on the far side of the street to prevent people from casually walking up the hill this is Gold Hill. The rich people live up at the top of it Bon said. We're supposed to go around to one of the gates to get in, but they wouldn't let a kid like me in, so let's climb the fence instead. It wasn't that high. But if Lemon hadn't been a magical dog, she wouldn't have been able to jump it. Bon seemed to realize that a moment later, because he added, maybe you could just walk through the gate and meet me on the other side. I'll float over Lemon said. She swapped her spectacles out for her feather charm, walked over to the wall, and levitated up to the top. Then she reached out with her front legs and scrambled over it. 
Bon watched her, his jaw hanging open that's so cool. Bon jumped up and, using his own magic, climbed over the fence to drop down next to her. Okay, that was way easier than I thought it'd be. Now we just need to get to the light, dodge the guards, and up we go. Wait, guards. Yeah, they're there to keep people from going up to the island who aren't supposed to be there. I guess you could just walk on by since your master is a wizard, but I can't. Unless you can get me through too. That would make it a lot easier. I don't know Lemon said. She hadn't realized there would be guards. She tried to think back and remember if anyone had told her about that. Nothing came to mind oh, home. Well, maybe you should try first. Or do you just want to sneak by? It might be easier to explain things up at the top of the island than to try to talk our way past the grants down here. Hey. You. What are you doing, kid? An older man wearing overalls and a green cap and smelling of leaves and soil was standing at the top of the hill, a metal rake in one hand and glaring down at them. He advanced menacingly, waving the rake with each step oh. Time to run, Lemon. Come on. Bon took off, which caused the old man to start yelling again as he gave chase. Lemon trotted along next to him, easily able to keep up. Should we go towards the light now? Not yet Bon said, not until we lose that guy. It was easy enough to leave him behind. They ran a wide loop around the base of Gold Hill until Bon pointed out a stand of trees, which they ducked into and out the other side. They didn't see him again after that, though Lemon did hear him yelling a bit later okay, easy enough. Now, like I said, sneak past the guards or try to talk. I don't know. I don't have an invitation or anything. My master and his familiar went and left me at home. I'm just trying to get something he left behind to him. So no official invitation. Might be better to sneak by them. Come on, let's go get a look and see what we're dealing with. A few minutes later, they were crouched near some shrubs looking at four men in armor with halberds posted in a square around the pillar of light. A brick path cut through the grass leading up to it, and a big house loomed over them in the background. It had its own wall, separated from the pillar by a wide field lots of open ground Bon said. Going to be hard to sneak across that during the day. Plus, how does it work? Do we just have to walk into the light to go up? I'm not sure Lemon said probably best to try to talk our way past them then, unless we can come up with a distraction good enough to get all four of them to leave. I'm just going to go explain who I am and why I need to go up. Wait, Lemon. Are you sure Lemon? She'd already walked off though. One of the guards noted her approach and turned to face her. Well hello there he said. Aren't you a pretty one? Hello, my name is Lemon. I need to go up to the conference please. The guards exchanged surprised glances. Do you have a pass? One asked warily what's a pass. So that's a no. Listen, if you don't have a pass, you can't go up. Are you sure? My master, Wizard Hagarth, is up there. I'm supposed to bring him something. Be that as it may, the pillar only lets you up if you have a pass. We can't do anything to change that. Oh, really? Can I try anyway? Sure, if you want. I guess it can't hurt anything. But sir, one of the other guards said. We're supposed to keep people away from it. People, not dogs. And this one is obviously a familiar or something. Sir, go ahead, dog. Good luck. Debate settled, the guards let Lemon walk through. She padded forward, tail wagging, and stepped into the light. Other than being too bright to see, nothing changed. She could still smell the leather and steel of the guards. Lemon took a few steps backwards out of the column of light and looked up at the bottom of the floating island. Oh, now what? How do I get the potion up to Hagarth? Told you the guard said. You got to have a pass. Lemon peered up at the underside of the island and gave an annoyed huff. Well, where do I get one of those? Ah, uh, from the conference, I think. 
but I can't get up there. Yeah. The guard scratched his head and traded glances with his friends. I'm not sure. She didn't remember Hagarth having any sort of pass, and he went to the conference every year. Maybe they were for the non-wizards who also attended. No doubt all the wizards would just use their magic to get up there. Lemon didn't have any sort of spell that would let her travel on a beam of light dot but she did have a spell that would let her fly. Kind of okay, thanks for letting me try. I think I've got it figured out now. Bye. As she rushed off, one of the guards behind her said, Should we do something about that? Nah, our job is to guard this spot. If she gets up there some other way, that's not our fault. Bon joined her as she walked away from the light. Didn't work, huh? No. You need some kind of magic pass to go up that way. I've got another idea though. They walked down Gold Hill, easily avoiding the mean old man who smelled like dirt when he spotted them again, and hurried away from the pillar of light. While they walked, Lemon explained her plan. So it's kind of high, but I think I can levitate all the way up there. We just need to go to the edge and I'll go up over the side. Are you sure? Bon asked, shooting the island an uncertain glance. That's a bit more than kind of high. I've never tried Lemon admitted. The island was much higher than that cliff she'd gone up, much higher than Hagarth's tower, and weirdly, the thought of ascending through open, empty air was somehow scarier than going up the side of a building or a cliff dot but Hagarth was up there. He needed his potion, and it was Lemon's job to bring it to him. If this was what she needed to do, she was going to do it. It probably wouldn't be that bad anyway. She'd just close her eyes and it would be over in no time. They came to a spot where they were out from the island's shadow, and the two of them eyed up the edge. I think a few more blocks that way Bon said. It took a few attempts before they agreed that they had found the right spot, which happened to be next to a well in a square surrounded by squat houses. Last chance to change your mind, Bon said. Lemon considered that for a moment. It wasn't dangerous, as far as she could tell. It was just going straight up, using her rope to drag herself forward, and landing on the island. Sure, it was high, but that just meant a bit more travel time. She'd be fine. Her biggest concern was making sure she'd lined herself upright with the edge of the island. She was actually kind of trusting Bon with that. Humans had better eyes for long distances than dogs did I'm going to do it. Thanks for the help. I should be thanking you. You saved my butt from those guys. I guess I should be getting home now. My parents are probably wondering where I'm at, and I need to tell them what happened. Good luck. When I get up there, I'll see if I can get Hagarth to get a pass for you to come visit. That would be amazing. It's got to be incredible up there. So many wizards, so much magic. Lemon loved Hagarth dearly but amazing and incredible were not the first words that came to mind when she considered her master. Goofy was a good word to describe him. Absent-minded. She'd met a lot of wizards, and Hagarth was one of a kind. That was probably for the best. Who else would have taken in a glowing puppy without a second's hesitation? He'd even done it over midnight's objections. Lemon's tail started wagging on its own by, she said. Then she focused on her feather charm, looked up, and started rising into the air. Shouts of surprise came from below her, but she was well past anyone's reach before they could think to do anything about it. Lemon's legs kicked reflexively, not that it did anything to help her fly up faster, and her tail blurred back and forth. About halfway up, she knew she'd misjudged her position. The bottom curve of the island was right overhead, and she needed to be farther to her left and they'd been so careful about lining it up, too. Still, it was going to be close, and maybe she could make it work. She rose higher and higher, and as she got closer, she noticed the island actually shifting a bit. It wasn't much, just a single length of her snout to her tail, back and forth, and actually that was a good thing. Her aim hadn't been that far off, the target had just moved. 
All Lemon had to do was wait for it to move out of her way, rise up a little bit higher, and then wait for it to come back under her feet. It was going to be even easier than she'd expected. Of course, she was getting pretty tired, and she wasn't quite there yet. It only occurred to her right then that if she lost the magic this high up before she actually made it onto the island, that things could be bad. Well, there was an easy solution there. She just wouldn't let the levitation spell go. Her tail maybe wasn't wagging quite as fast anymore. There was a low whine coming from somewhere but it definitely wasn't Lemon. Nope. It must have been the wind. The island grew huge in her sight, so big that it blocked out half the sky above her. In another minute, her nose was touching the earth and she was scrambling to claw her way over to the lip of the island so that she could get on top of it. It swayed gently, which sometimes helped and sometimes made it worse, and eventually she managed to float over top and get all four paws back on solid ground Phew. That was exhausting. She was standing near some sort of pole with a purple triangular pennant on top and a rope tied to it. The rope led to another pole, and another one, and another one. As far as she could see, it circled around the island, but it wasn't really a fence or anything. She could walk right under it, after all. She could see some buildings all huddled together on the far end of the island. So she started off that way. Lemon made it precisely four steps past the rope line when she felt the magic ripple through the air. It was a familiar sensation, one she'd felt many times in her Garth's tower. He liked to set up wards to ensure his workshop wasn't disturbed when he left potions simmering or needed something to age undisturbed. As his chief research assistant, Lemon sometimes had to step over the wards, which would be fine, except that Hagarth didn't always remember to key her in. That was what the sensation felt like, and nothing good ever happened when she stepped over a ward that she wasn't keyed into. At best, there would be loud noises that definitely didn't scare her so bad she peed on the floor under a table in the workshop one time. Other options were less pleasant. Wizards took their security very seriously. The best thing to do was make it to the buildings. Then she could find her Garth and he'd straighten everything out. Lemon scrambled towards the far side of the island as the alarms started going off. These ones included colorful lights too. Lemon yipped and scampered away from the explosion of noise and lights behind her. That was when the streamers of fire started pouring down. Lemon ran faster. They rained down around Lemon, many, many more than she could count, in every direction. Lemon panicked and ran, screaming the whole way as scorching lines of fire flashed through the air. When she found whichever wizard had invented this ward, she was going to bite him right on the butt. Lemon cleared the zone of fire raining down from the sky and slowed down. Somehow, she'd avoided singeing her fur but that had been the scariest thing to happen to her since she left the tower. Thankfully, it had only lasted a few seconds and she'd wait, what was that grinding sound, Lemon looked around curiously, but there was nothing to be seen, not including the grass fires behind her. But she could clearly hear the sound, and that couldn't be good. The smell of freshly churned dirt filled her nose, and a moment later she saw the ground shaking in front of her. It moved forward like a wave, and the grass humped upwards under her feet. She was tossed into the air, up and backwards over the grass fires and towards the edge of the island. It was a good thing she still had her levitation charm, but that wasn't going to stop her momentum. If she didn't do anything, she'd end up out in the open air, with nowhere to go but back down into the city. The rope snaked out of her bag and she looped it over one of the poles. With her teeth clamped down firmly on its length, she was able to stop herself from going over the edge and pull herself back to safety. With her paws back on solid ground, she glared at the buildings on the other side. Those wards were completely uncalled for. They weren't going to stop her, though. She just needed to hurry through them before they reset. Lemon ran forward, made it a few steps, and promptly realized that they had already reset. The fire was every bit as scary the second time but she ran even faster and left it behind. When the wave of earth rolled forward to catch her, Lemon jumped high and used her feather charm to float over it. The magic passed by harmlessly beneath her, and she landed in a run. 
There was still plenty of ground left to cover, but hopefully the wards were only circling the outside edges of the island. A wave of thunder crashed against her, causing her to stumble when she missed a step, and making everything around her spin crazily. Lemon shook her head, sending her ears flopping around it, and got back to her feet. This is crazy. Why did they ward the island like this? Whatever the reason, there must have just been too much space to create a solid barrier, so the wizards had gone with traps. While she had a healthy respect for the powers wizards wielded, she wasn't particularly impressed by these traps. They weren't going to be enough to stop her. She started forward again, and pillars of burning light burst up from the ground around her. Deftly, Lemon wove her way through them, even when they started moving around in some sort of complicated pattern she couldn't quite figure out. She relied on sheer reflexes to dart through the gaps in their formation, though sometimes that meant having to go sideways or backwards. The grass was blackened anywhere the light passed over, seared and smoking. She wasn't about to let the same thing happen to her. Then the sky darkened, and Lemon looked up to see a giant flat slab of stone skipping through the air in her direction. It was far, far too wide to dodge, and moving so fast that it would be on her in seconds. Each time it hit the ground, it tore a huge chunk of earth away and rose back into the air. Maybe, if she ran fast enough towards it, it would fly over her head and land behind her. Lemon ran for all she was worth, but she knew she wasn't going to make it. The stone was going to hit her head on. There was only one way to save herself, and she hated that she'd have to do it. The potion of unlimited invincibility wasn't capped, corked, or stop it in any way. The fact that nothing ever spilled was one of the nice things about her bag charm, and Lemon had long since developed the habit of just shoving whatever she wanted in there without worrying about those kinds of details. That was good because right now she had about a second before she got squished under a giant slab of stone. She gave her master a brief mental apology, materialized the potion out of her bag, and tilted it back into her mouth. For one single moment, she forgot all about how much danger she was in. All she could think of was that the potion was the most awful thing she had ever tasted. It was unbelievable. It didn't smell bad, or good really, or like anything at all but the taste was miserable. Even by dog standards, she wanted to gag. Then she remembered why she'd drunk it and had to focus on not throwing it back up. The potion flowed through her, and she felt it begin to work just as the rock slammed down on top of her. Lemon was driven straight into the ground, then dragged backwards as the stone slab skipped back up into the air and leaped forward again. She gave herself a good shake and looked around. There was a lemon-shaped indent in the ground, still visible despite all the ripped-up turf around it. It was a remarkably good outline of her, all things considered. More importantly, she felt fine. Being flattened under the rock hadn't so much as ruffled her fur. Tail wagging, Lemon raced towards the buildings. More blasts of fire rained down on her, but she ignored them. Beams of light swept across her, burning the grass but leaving her untouched. Holes opened up in front of her and attempted to trap her legs in the ground, but Lemon just pulled the limbs back out. She ran through all the wards like they were nothing, straight towards her goal, with her only deviation being when she spotted a crowd of people gathered to watch her. As she approached, a bald man wearing a black polo that said Wizcon across the chest moved to intercept her. Excuse me, I'm going to need to know who your wizard is, he said. The obstacle course is closed right now. The what? Lemon looked back over her shoulder what else would it be? Are you saying you wandered in by accident? The man was giving her a very hard look now I, yes. I'm sorry, I didn't know what it was. I was just trying to get to my master to deliver his potion, Lemon's tail drooped and she whined, but I, I had to drink it. I'm a bad girl. The worst dog ever. Lemon couldn't help herself. She started howling in misery. After everything she'd done, all the hard work, all the walking, it was all a waste. She was practically within sight of her goth, but now she didn't have the potion anymore. The enormity of what she'd just done had fully caught up with her, just calm down there the man said. 
I need to know who your wizard is. We'll get it sorted out. Don't worry, I don't think you're in trouble if it really was an accident. A man pushed through the gathered crowd of wizards and peered down at her. Blinking large, owlish eyes behind his glasses, he said, Lemon. Is that you? She looked over and said miserably, Hi, Finister. Sir, is this your familiar? The bald man said no, no. She's not anybody's familiar. She's the pet of a friend of mine. I didn't know she was even here at the conference. Hagarth forgot his potion. I was bringing it to him, but I... I... Oh, I ruined it all. He did what now? Finister said, looking confused. I think there's been a mix-up, Lemon. No, no, he made a potion for the alchemy competition, but then he was trying to get everything packed because he forgot to before the portal showed up, and he didn't remember the potion, so I was bringing it to him, but then I drank it just now and it's gone and I feel kind of funny. That's, uh, probably the potion wearing off. I don't suppose you know if it has any side effects. Lemon didn't say anything. She just looked at Finister piteously, hunched forward, and vomited up a wad of what looked like unraveled grey wool socks. I think I need to lie down. The bald guy said something else, but Lemon didn't catch it. She slumped to the ground and passed out. Asterisk 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 Lemon. Lemon. Come on, girl. Time to wake up. Unk, what if I offered you a sausage? Would that get you to open your eyes? Lemon's eyes didn't open, but her tail thumped against the ground. She felt a hand on her head, giving her scritches behind her eyes. Her tail thumped harder come on now. You're all right? Master, she asked, cracking one eye open to see her garth sitting on the ground next to her feeling better, he asked no I feel awful. Well, that potion wasn't really made for dogs but I am glad you had it to keep you safe. Quite the demonstration too. They had to disable the obstacle course so people could go look at the lemon-shaped hole you left behind. I'm so sorry Lemon said, wiggling forward and laying her head on her garth's leg. He kept petting her. When I saw you forgot your potion, I knew I needed to bring it to you. And I almost got it all the way here too, but I messed up at the last minute. Oh. Don't worry about that Hagarth said with a laugh. I didn't forget the potion. But you did. I had it. I carried it all the way here. I know, but the whole point of the conference is to show off how it's made. That's why I took all the reagents out of the cupboards, you silly dog. I made a new one yesterday in front of an audience. What? But I, it was so far, and there was, it was all a waste of time. Well I don't know about that. Did you accomplish anything worthwhile on your trip? She thought about that for a second, and decided she had. She'd stopped the harpies from completing their ritual, and gotten rid of that swamp hag. Most importantly, she'd saved Nemba from whatever that vampire had been planning, and she supposed she'd probably stopped those men from beating up Bon. Hopefully that was all they'd planned on doing I think I did. Hagarth smiled at her and said, I'll look forward to hearing all about it later. I bet it's quite the story. It's a good thing Finister happened to be sitting on the patio when you showed up though. Conference security was about ready to send you back down to the city since you don't have a pass. The first thing we need to do is get you one, then I think you could take a nap in our room if you'd like. Why is Finister here? I thought he said he wasn't going to another conference after that thing with the exploding frogs a few years ago. Hagarth chuckled at that. Oh, good times. They charged him triple the cost of the room just to have it cleaned. I don't think he ever quite forgave Morgellan, but she was too busy to attend this year, so he decided to come last minute. Said he wanted to catch up with everybody. That kind of makes me glad I showed up then. You should have told me he was going to be here. I didn't know myself Hagarth said. Finister had a reputation in the wizard community as a bit of a hermit, and when he'd stopped showing up at the yearly conference, he'd fallen out of touch with a lot of people. 
He'd been by to visit Hagarth a few times when they collaborated on an alchemy project over the last few years, but it had been happening less and less often, which was a shame. He always smelled like food, and he was always willing to share a bite of whatever he happened to have in his pocket. Finister was probably Lemon's favorite wizard, after Hagarth of course I wonder if he has any sausages. I ran out. I don't know about sausages, but I'm sure he has some thwaite, what you do mean, you ran out. Lemon squirmed around and got back to her feet. So let's go get that pass now. I want to see all the neat stuff on display this year. Lemon. Hagarth's voice had a hard note of warning in it I had to have something to eat on the trip. You wouldn't want me to starve, would you? How much something? Lemon's tail drooped down to tuck between her legs. All of the sausages. Hagarth was aghast. All of them. That's impossible. In just two days. There was enough for three weeks hanging in the pantry. And that bag of jerky on the top shelf she added shamefully not my cockatrice jerky. Lemon, how could you? There's still a little bit left, see. Lemon pulled the jerky out of her bag and floated it over to her goth, who took it mutely and peered inside. He reached in to pull out a single strip of meat, barely a finger's length long, then turned the bag upside down and gave it a shake. Nothing but a crumb or two fell out. Then Hagarth noticed her eyes fixed on the jerky held in his hand and not the empty bag. He moved his hand to the left. Lemon's eyes moved with it. Back to the right. She followed the motion. With a sigh, Hagarth tossed the jerky to her and she snapped it out of the air. After noisily chewing it and swallowing, she started sniffing at the bag. Oh, come on. It's empty. You know this. Right, sorry. I'm just kind of hungry. And thirsty. Maybe a bit of sausage would help. I don't have any sausage, either on me or in my own home, apparently. You'll just have to suffer the loss Hagarth told her severely. Lemon let out a whining sigh, but a second later, she saw a wizard go flying by, standing on what looked like a kitchen chair that was leaving a trail of explosive sparks behind it. She let out a friendly, excited little bark and her tail started pumping again. What's that? It looks like fun. Dilarau made it Hagarth said sourly. He's crashed into the side of a building three times already today, that I know of. And caught a garden on fire. That's amazing Lemon said, watching the wizard fly away that is one word for it, I suppose. Come on. Let's go get you a pass, and then I'll show you where our room is. Oh, right. Can we get two passes? I have a new friend here who can do magic. He wants to see the conference too. And maybe we can find him a master to apprentice under. A new talent, huh? That sounds worth checking into. All right, two passes it is. And can we get something to eat too? I think I smell some pork chops over that way. Hagarth sighed and said, Yes, Lemon, we can get some pork chops too. Lemon followed Hagarth down the hall and to the levitation platform. It was stationed in the center of the building, and included some advanced talisman controls to move it from floor to floor. After manipulating the magic to bring it down to ground level, they hopped on board and it rose up to the fourth floor. Here's our room. 412 he said, opening the door to reveal a room that was much bigger than it could possibly be based on how close the neighboring doors were. The interior was lavishly furnished with a bed containing a plump mattress and four extra thick fluffy pillows. A counter ran along one wall with a crystal bowl in the center and a water-generating rune scribed into its surface. The window had a reading nook built in, which Midnight was laying on and sunning herself back already, she asked. I thought the lecture on advanced telemetry was supposed to be three ho what are you doing here? Hi Midnight. Lemon barked. Midnight shot her an absolutely venomous look, which Lemon completely ignored as she padded into the room. This is really nice she said, looking around. Almost nicer than back home. Hagarth, why? It's my vacation. Just, why do you do this to me? 
Well, it seems that Lemon misunderstood what was happening and thought that I needed the test potion I left back home. She walked all this way to bring it to me. Midnight's tail lashed back and forth in agitation. Of course she did. Wait, how did she get here so quickly? There's no way. Oh, that's easy. I walked really far. Look, I'll show you. Lemon pulled the map out of her bag and held it up. She pointed towards the harpy woods with her snout. I cut through here, see? And there were a bunch of bird ladies, those are called harpies. Anyway, they were doing this ritual when I found them, but it smelled like bad magic, so I is that the map from my sitting room. Hagarth interrupted no, this is the one from your bedroom. A comma midnight said, her head snapping over to look at the map. I got that as a gift. It's a collector's item. There's a reason it was behind glass. Do you know how expensive that was? No. Lemon was confused. There was a map in the sitting room, but it wasn't as pretty as the one from the bedroom. It was also smaller and harder to read because the letters were written so fancy that they didn't look normal anymore Hagarth. Do something. He peered at the map and said, well, it doesn't look damaged. I'm sure we can clean it back up. There's dried dog snot all over one side. Midnight screeched I had to sneeze once while I was looking at it Lemon told her. Anyway. So I stopped the harpies from summoning a demon, but then there was a swamp hag they were working with I had to beat to. She was really mean and had even more bad magic than the harpies did. Oh, and then I got to Tamble's Crossing and that says Bramble's Crossing. Or at least it did before you sneezed all over it. There was a vampire there who abducted a human puppy right in front of me. And me and her dad teamed up and took that vampire down to get her back. I had to use all my glow power to make it happen, and then I can't believe you just took it. I saved for like four months for that. When I got to the city I met another human, but this one could do magic too. He showed it to me, but it was only two spells. He was trying to help me get up to the conference, but the light wouldn't let me up and there was this old guy who smelled like he had been rolling around in the dirt how did you even get all the creases in it? The bag magically preserves it. Hagarth watched, a rather bemused expression on his face, as Lemon excitedly recounted her adventures and Midnight bemoaned the condition of her precious map. Finally, she snatched the map from Lemon and stored it away in her own bag. Thank you, Lemon, for that riveting story. But I'm sure you want to explore and see what's on display at the conference this year, not sit around a boring old room. Oh yeah. I do want to do that. But we need to go get Bon first, right Hagarth? I promised him. Oh, ah, uh, yes. About that. I forgot that I'm scheduled to give a lecture on how to properly mix Hestianic reagents with Alcorane in to avoid creating a nomuric reaction in an hour. I have to go set up for that and I don't really have time right now. You'll have to go back and get your friend yourself. But what if I can't get back up? Lemon asked. The light didn't work when I tried it. Well, you have your pass now, so it'll work fine Hagarth told her what if it doesn't. And I have to levitate all the way up here again, and the wards shoot fire at me again. It'll be fine, Lemon. The obstacle course wards aren't even turned on right now. But they might be by the time I get back. Lemon, I really just don't have the time right now. I'm sorry. You'll have to wait until tomorrow if you don't want to go get him by yourself. But I promised. Lemon said. Midnight, help. The cat narrowed her eyes to slits and said, I wouldn't help you right now even if you fell into the bathtub. I hope you get sprayed by a skunk. That reminds me. I saw a skunk near the old bridge back home. But I ran away before it could get me small mercy Hagarth muttered. Midnight, would you please escort Lemon to pick up her friend? What? Hagarth, no. No. Absolutely not. No way. Midnight. Nuuuuu. Not doing it. Remind me, 
who is the familiar in this relationship again. Come on. It's my vacation too. Hagarth gave Lemon's head a pat and said, Why don't you go wait for her by the elevator? I promise she'll be out soon. Okay Lemon said, tail wagging dot asterisk 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 stupid Hagarth. Stupid conference. Stupid Lemon ruining my vacation midnight muttered to herself as they walked down the streets. She lifted her voice and said, Do you even know where this kid lives? Somewhere by Wall Road Lemon said, looking around for a street sign that she could read. Midnight was standing, her two back paws balanced on Lemon's back and her front paws on Lemon's head as she rode the dog around town. She'd claimed she didn't want to get her paws dirty with all the grime and mud on the ground. It certainly drew a lot of attention, but outside of the guards who'd been surprised to see Lemon again when she appeared inside the pillar of light, nobody had stopped her to ask any questions. Midnight's paw cuffed her ear and she said, If it's by Wall Road, why are you going north instead of west? Oh, right. Which way is west again? I cannot believe you managed to follow a map all the way here Midnight said it was really hard. I had to remember which way the sun rises, but then I followed the road the rest of the way. Midnight groaned and muttered something that Lemon thought sounded like, what did I do to deserve this? Was it the mice? It was, wasn't it? But she couldn't be sure, because she got distracted by a guy walking by eating some sort of meat on a wooden skewer. She tried to catch his eye to see if he would share, but he ignored Lemon and just kept walking west midnight demanded. That way. They walked along, or rather Lemon walked and midnight rode on her back, until they found Wall Road, then they followed it in the direction that midnight said was south while Lemon sniffed for Bond's scent. It was easy to notice once she came across it since it had the rare tingle of magic in it. All wizards had that scent though in Master Hagarth's case, it was almost overpowered by alchemical smells. Bonds was very faint, but it was there. Lemon found the scent and followed it along. Here's where those men caught up to us she told Midnight when they stopped next to the shattered old crate that used to cover the crawl space entrance is your new wizard friend hiding in the dirt under a house. Not very wizard-like behavior, if you ask me. No, he's not here Lemon told Midnight. Give me a second to figure out which of these scents is the newest. Lemon, isn't that one second, this is really tricky. Lemon. One second. Please. Is it the boy standing right there with the bucket waving at you? Midnight asked her. Lemon looked up, then she gave a little bark of joy and jumped forward, an action which quickly flung Midnight loose and caused her to hiss in displeasure when she landed. Bon. There you are. Guess what? I got you a pass for the conference. Well, technically my master got it for you, but I've got it here in my bag and we can go right now. Hi, Lemon. Um. I don't think I can go Bon said. I kind of got in trouble about the whole thing with those guys. What kind of trouble? Midnight asked sharply. Bon's mouth formed a little O of surprise and he peered down at her. Well, you can talk to. I didn't know there were so many talking animals in the world. There's about a hundred of them right above your head right now Midnight said. Now what's this about not being able to go? So, like, if those guys hadn't caught me stealing back the money they took, it would have been fine, but since they did catch me, and they know who I am, they went back to my parents and demanded all the money back plus extra. Ah, trouble with the local street gangs. A tale as old as civilization itself. Ah, uh, sure. Yeah. Anyway, now I'm kind of in trouble and I have to do chores. I'm getting water from the well right now Bon said, holding up the bucket by way of demonstration. So I guess I don't have time to go to the wizard show. Plus mom would probably get mad at me. Well, madder. Okay, I think there's a simple solution here. We just need to go explain to your parents what kind of opportunity you have here. Bon glanced over at Lemon, confusion plain on his face. What opportunity? I mean, it looks really fun and all, but I'm not dumb enough to try to steal from a bunch of wizards. 
Lemon said you can do magic midnight said. Is that not correct? No, I can. But so what? If you can do magic, that means you could become a wizard's apprentice, and then a wizard yourself. Getting you up to that conference is the first step in finding you a master willing to train you midnight explained. Halfway through her explanation, Bond's jaw dropped. Me. A wizard. I don't think that's possible. It is very possible, if you can really do magic. Here, I'll show you Bon said. He cast around for a small rock, picked it up, and then made it disappear from one hand and into the other. Then he stuck his hands onto the side of a nearby house and pulled himself up off the ground. I'm still working on that one. It's hard to make my feet stick to. Magical, indeed. Very well, let's go talk to your parents and get this all sorted out. Eh. Bon's going to learn to be a wizard lemon said as she pranced around the boy in a circle. He just stood there, stars in his eyes, and gazed up at the floating island. Eventually, Midnight got sick of the frolicking and got them moving again. It was a slow journey though, with them having to basically drag a dazed Bon through the streets and get directions from him repeatedly. He just kept mumbling to himself about wizards and magic and food the whole way. But eventually, in an act of supreme patience, Midnight did manage to shepherd Lemon and Bon to his front door. We are not adopting any strays, Bon, a woman practically yelled as soon as they walked through the door. I've told you, we can't afford it, especially not after that stunt you pulled this afternoon. Who are you calling a stray? Midnight said. I am impeccable groomed and beautiful. The woman jumped and eyeballed Midnight and Lemon. You, really did meet a talking animal. I told you I did Bon said yeah, but I figured you were lying to me again. You're not supposed to lie to your parents Lemon told Bon. He scowled back and said, I know that. Knock it off, you two Midnight snapped. She turned back to Bon's mother and said, my name is Midnight. I am the familiar to Wizard Hagarth, who is currently attending the conference. We were informed by Wizard Hagarth's lab assistant that's me. Lemon said that she had met a boy who displayed magical aptitude Midnight continued smoothly, ignoring Lemon's interruption. We're here to take him up to the conference for some testing and see if we can find a master looking to take on a new apprentice. What, because of that little slate of hand thing? That's not real magic. I assure you that it is Midnight told her. We've confirmed it ourselves. But that's nothing. Any street corner performer can do that. Perhaps, but the difference here is that he is actually using magic to move the item, not misdirection. Told you Bon muttered. It did so count as magic. Bon's mother looked back and forth between them, thought about it for a moment, and then let out a thoroughly gobsmacked, ha. Huh. How about that? I'm going to assume you don't have any objections to your son going up to the conference with us. Midnight asked well, I can't say that I know Bon's mother said. What exactly does that mean? Is Bon going to be in any danger? Midnight shook her head and hopped up onto the kitchen table next to Bon's mother. He will be in no danger. He will be introduced to various wizards who are looking for an apprentice. Most likely they'll want a demonstration of his current repertoire of spells. They may see if he can learn a few basic incantations quickly, just to take a good measure of him. Given how many wizards are currently present, I would say it's his best chance to find a master quickly. I can't promise anything on behalf of another wizard, of course, but I think he has good odds. Lemon sat back and watched Midnight work. She was always like this whenever anyone came around or they went out on business, so prim and proper. Her whole manner of speech changed and she sat straight upright without ever moving. It was like she was a totally different cat. Lemon could not help but contrast the midnight in front of her to the one in her memories who'd had a bucket of water spilled on her once when Lemon accidentally bumped the table it was sitting on. There was a stark difference, both in temperament and vocabulary. Lemon still didn't know the meanings to some of the words Midnight had said then. Hagarth had refused to tell her. Lemon looked over at Bon, 
who was listening with rapt attention as Midnight described some of the tasks Bon could be expected to tend to as a wizard's apprentice, and some of the things he could expect to learn from his master. His jaw practically dropped to the floor when Midnight mentioned the average wages of a journeyman wizard, and he wasn't the only one. Bon's mother sat down in one of the three chairs around the table, and she sat down hard and, and you're sure my little Bon could be a wizard? 100% Midnight said. I have seen the magic with my own eyes. My associate can literally smell it on him. It is not a question of whether he could be a wizard. He already is. The only question is who we will find to see to his training. I need to talk to my husband about this Bond's mother said. This is kind of a huge decision. I understand Midnight said soothingly. Will he be back soon? Not for a few hours. He went to pick up an extra shift at the mill, try to come up with a bit more coin. We're, a bit light right now. Bon's mother shot him a quick glare as she spoke. Rather than look ashamed, he scowled right back. We wouldn't be if we stopped giving those jerks money. We do not have a choice, Bon. You know this, and yet you insist on antagonizing them and making things harder for us. There are way more of us than there are of them. We should all tell them to get lost. What are they going to do, fight the whole street? Yes his mother said, her voice hard. That is exactly what they will do. And when they come in with knives and swords and spears, how will we defend ourselves? When they come in groups of twenty or thirty, do you think we'll be able to stop them? If this is such an issue, why doesn't the city guard do something? Midnight asked where do you think half the money they extort from us goes? If the guard comes in, it's going to be to help that group of thugs collect their share. The guards are being bad. Lemon gasped. But they're the guards. Their job is to be good. Everyone else in the room turned to look at Lemon. Midnight just rolled her eyes, Bon let out a snort, and his mother gave a sad shake of her head. I'm afraid it doesn't work that way around here. The guards only work for the rich people. For the rest of us, they are a hazard to be avoided whenever possible. That's dumb. Someone needs to fix that. Maybe someone will Midnight said. I know a budding young wizard who grew up right here and probably has some strong opinions about the how the people living on Wall Road are treated. He might very well come back in a few years when he has the power to make some changes. Then again, perhaps not. You never know what the future might hold, but it is certainly an option. I could learn how to set their butts on fire Bon said. Burn down that old warehouse they use as a headquarters, send them packing when they come around with their clubs in hand. Yeah, I like that idea. Probably not the best way to go about it. Most cities frown on us and Midnight said. But we've gotten a little off track. It would be best for Bon to come with us now while the wizards are still about their business at the conference. Once evening comes and they settle down for the night, it will be much more difficult to introduce Bon to potential new masters. Additionally, there is something of a spectacle to behold at the conference itself. It is quite the experience. Lemon was getting bored now. She knew it was important to get permission, but she was tired of talking about the conference. She wanted to go back to it and see all the new things wizards had come up with over the last year. Bon's mother didn't look like she was going to budge any time soon though. Lemon supposed it was understandable that she wanted to wait for Bon's father, but it was going to be hours and hours before he got home. Her refusing to make a decision was a decision in and of itself. Some smell caught Lemon's attention. She raised her snout and took a careful sniff. There are people outside the house she said, halting the conversation and dragging everyone's attention to her how many? Midnight asked six, I think. I recognize a few of them from the men who were chasing Bon earlier today. A second later, someone started pounding on the door. Bon's mother took one look at it and all the color drained from her face. What do they want now, she moaned. They already took all the money we had. Midnight jumped down from the table, 
casually strolled across the room, and opened the door with her own version of Wizard's Hand. Unlike Lemon, she didn't need a special collar charm to do it. The man who'd been pounding on it opened his mouth to speak, then paused and frowned when he realized there was nobody standing in front of him. Can I help you? Midnight asked from his feet up. Yeah. Um. The man's brain was clearly struggling to catch up to the unexpected reality of having a black house a cat answer the door and speak to him, but eventually it got there. He regained his confident swagger, and said, so the boss said on account of that little thief's attitude, we're supposed to take him in for a whipping. That way he'll learn his manners right. Know what, the man asked, his face slipping back into a mask of confusion we will not be allowing you to do that. This young man will be coming with us this afternoon. Or, just kick it one of the thugs said from behind the man. What's it going to do, hiss at you and claw your boot up? Lemon winced. Midnight did not like when people dismissed her, and she wasn't the nicest person on an average day. Just from the way her paws were flexing, claws popping in and out, Lemon could tell she was mad. Really mad. Come on she whispered to Bon as she dragged him farther away from the door. The man's foot cocked back, boot up in the air and a nasty grin on his face. Then he flew backwards 30 feet to slam into the wall that gave Wall Road its name. He was immediately followed by the other thug who'd suggested kicking Midnight. The cat's head turned slowly to stare at the rest of the group I believe I made myself clear. Would anyone else like to disagree with me? She's really scary when she gets mad Lemon said yeah Bon agreed, gulping. Does she get mad a lot? Not usually like this. None of the other thugs had anything else to say about the idea of taking Bon in for a thrashing. They picked up the two that Midnight had thrown across the street and scurried off while she gave them a baleful glare. Only after all six of them had run off did she move. The door swung closed gently behind her as she slunk back across the floor and jumped up to the table again as I was saying, it really is in Bond's best interest to come to the conference with us. Not only would it help him begin his career as a wizard, it might just be a good idea for him to spend a night away from the neighborhood. Perhaps even to. I guess you're right Bond's mother said, no longer quite so forceful and argumentative. Bon, you're sure you're okay with this? Of course, Mom. Why wouldn't I want to go to a floating island in the sky full of wizards doing awesome magic stuff? Beats hanging around here doing chores. I can't believe I'm saying this, but, fine. Go ahead. I'll talk to your father when he gets home, and I want you back here tomorrow morning so we can talk about all of this wizard business as a family, okay? Got it, Mom. And with that, finally they were off to the conference. The three of them appeared inside a rune-inscribed circle on a floor that looked like it was made out of glass. It wasn't, of course, but Lemon could see the city below from where she sat inside the circle. Bon also looked down, let out a strangled yelp, and rushed away from the not-glass portion of the floor. Midnight sauntered past him and said, Come on. We've got a few people you need to meet, then if none of them work out. We'll have to go farther afield. I'm assuming you'd prefer a master who lives somewhat close to the city so that you can easily go home to see your family. I guess so Bon said then we'd best see those ones first. Lemon and Bon followed the cat out of the room with the not glass floor and into the conference's main hall. A bunch of staff members were nearby, some working security on the floor and some stationed behind informational kiosks. Midnight approached the second kind, leaped up onto the desk, and said, Pardon me. I'm looking for a few wizards and I was wondering if you could tell me if they had booked spots in any particular demonstrations or lectures right now. Um, I don't think we can tell you if they are in the audience for an event, but I can definitely let you know if they are hosting anything. Who are you looking for? Lemon tried to pay attention. She really did. She knew this was important for Bon. But it was also boring. Most of the stuff Midnight did was boring, now that she thought about it. 
Why would anyone spend time talking about schedules and organization when there was a guy just over there who was literally juggling fire into a giant blazing circle while another guy was shooting bursts of water trying to quench the flames in the air? Bon must have agreed, because he was staring open-mouthed at the conference floor, where there were more examples of magic going on than Lemon could even count. Wizards conjured up fantastical devices, things made of brass and steel, glass and stone that had purposes Lemon couldn't begin to guess at. Other wizards displayed their mastery over the elements, or competed in tasks. One entire corner was taken up by a husband and wife pair of wizards who were crafting a golem to a live audience. Something blew up nearby, sending a great cloud of purple fumes rolling across the air. Immediately, 